If you have a Bible this morning and you would read along in our scripture text, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, We're going to take a reading from the book of Ephesians chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to read with us in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read beginning in verse um, 21, at least to the end of the chapter and maybe just through the chapter mark. So Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll begin our reading verse in verse 21. Now, a few weeks ago, um, I read Ephesians chapter 5, and we gave a lot of context to the book of Ephesians and background, um, spent a lot of time doing that so that we could get to verses 15 through 19, and we kind of dwelt in that area. Uh, That kind of started from me studying verses 21 through chapter 6, verse 9. I was studying that for quite a long time. And uh, didn't feel the freedom to preach on that, but felt the, uh, the desire at the time to preach on those verses in Ephesians 5, 15 through 19. Uh, but today I feel uh, inclined to follow that up, I suppose, with um, what, is in, what is afterward in that text. So we're going to read Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 21. Pray for me this morning, uh, please. Says this, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I'm going to read just a few more verses into chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That will conclude our reading this morning, and forgive any of the mistakes that I may have made in the reading. Uh, But the title of our message this morning is, Husbands, a Picture of Christ in the Home. Husbands, a Picture of Christ in the Home. It is a travesty today how distorted that our nation has made genders, sex, marriage, gender roles or the roles of the home. We could never estimate the damage and harm that it has done to individuals in our nation over the last 20 years because of this distortion. Now, I've seen a lot of damage also done in an attempt to counter the radical changes that are trying to be made. Many people fearful of these radical changes, and rightfully so, allow this as Christians, we are often pulled into the political sphere. And I would caution us this morning that 
if we are constantly finding ourselves getting pulled into the political sphere and reasoning and rationalizing how it's going to affect our nation, how it's going to pragmatically have impacts on our city or the various laws that might get enacted, and by focusing on that, leave the eternal consequences, we need to be careful. Because what happens so often is that Christians will take a biblical worldview about a topic like gender or sex or marriage, but enunciate a political rationale. And by doing so, they add to the loud noise and hysteria, which seems as though we'll never be settled in our nation. And I hope that's not the case. As Christians... We ought to be compelled to support the biblical worldview of marriage for the reasons that God primarily backs it. And we need to be able to articulate to people not only what the Bible says, but what God's ultimate purpose in marriage, in the role of a husband, and the role of a wife, is ultimately meant to do. We can go and look up plenty of studies which practically support the idea that a two-parent family with biological parents raising children is the most beneficial way for our culture. And we can pull statistics from the effects that it can have in uh, uh, any number of areas, and I'm not going to go into it this morning, but there are, it's, it's clear if you want to know the truth that it is better for a society, generally speaking, and it is generally better for children and a family unit if that is the way that children are raised. But let us beware as Christians on only focusing on the temporal benefits of the family unit. God not only created the family unit and the specific roles which he designed in Genesis for the practical benefit of passing on truth from one generation and the benefit that it would give to children from one generation to the next. But there is also an eternal purpose at work here that transcends our temporary lives and the temporary life of our nation. And so as we go out into the marketplace of ideas and we express what the Christian perspective is, Let us make sure that we're rooted deep on why God established the home the way he did. I can remember as a a young person sitting in church, if this scripture was ever read, I would kind of go, ooh, right? That 22nd verse just in our culture holds so much weight. Wives, submit to yourselves, to your husbands, as unto the Lord. And the extreme Feminist movement in our nation has, in my opinion, harmed women and continues to. But perhaps what it's done more than anything is it's harmed what God intended for the home. This morning, I want to speak to husbands today. Because when I read this text in the book of Ephesians, if we understand what Paul is saying... We would not tremble at the language which has been distorted in our culture, the words wives submit, and be angered by that. But rather what we would see in Ephesians chapter 5 is a calling for every husband that is well beyond our ability and which ought to cause us as men to tremble in fear at the responsibility we have to God And to our families. Notice here that there is a picture that Paul is trying to indicate. And he is telling us that the reason why that he created this dynamic in the home of the roles of a husband and a wife. And I would go further to even say our biological and physiological makeup is no doubt in part designed the way it is 
to manifest and to bring clarity to these eternal truths. And he, he's trying to bring out this picture that he says is a mystery and was especially a mystery long, long ago. Husbands, we are to represent Jesus Christ. In this picture, that's the, that's the representative and the reflection that we are in our home. Wives, you're a picture of the church. And I'll say this, there are many ways that the gospel can be communicated to people. And one of them is through the pulpit. And some of them is through a church service like this with the singing of, of music and testimonies from God's people and evangelizing out there. But there's also a powerful way that people can live out the gospel every day. The Bible teaches us, you know, God in the Old Testament was this figure that obviously if you knew him in your heart, you understood him just like we do today a lot better. And yet there is something about the sight. There's something about the five senses, the touching of something and, and being able to see it and hear it for yourself that brings life to an idea or to a person. We learn in John chapter 1 that the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And John said in his old age, we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That God in heaven who throughout time communicated to mankind through the prophets and through the proclaiming of his word now came in the, in the appearance of sinful flesh, he came in man's flesh and he dwelt among us and he said, I beheld him and I saw him and they watched him year after year after year in his ministry, healing people and doing good. They saw the embodiment of God, the book of Colossians tells us. What has strengthened my understanding of who God is is the fact that when I read about the life of Jesus, he fully embodies the person and character of God himself. And I can know him better and understand him more by seeing and reading about the life of Jesus Christ. And yet, husbands, in this text, you and I are called to be representatives of Jesus Christ in our home. We are to act and to live out in our home in a fashion similar to that of Christ. And by embodying those virtues and characters of Christ, preach the gospel and live out the gospel to our children every day. Don't get me wrong. God can use the power and he chooses to use the power of his spoken word to reach the hearts of people. But it is an enlivening, it is a life-changing thing when you see every day God's character lived out in your home in a person. Forgiveness is this academic concept that we can read about and we can study and we can see examples of. But when you have been the recipient of profound forgiveness and you see the suffering victim willingly showing love and grace and mercy to somebody, does it not enliven what the word forgiveness truly means? What our children need today in their homes is to see the character of Christ lived out Every day. I'm not going to say it doesn't do them any good, but it does them less good. If the only time that they hear and see things about Christ is in the house of God. They need it in their homes. And they need it in the relationship that is one of the most intimate relationships you could ever have. There is something about a father's love and approval that all people hunger for. And when that paternal figure is living out in a way purposely to show forth Christ to his family, it is the best hope he has to ensure the message of Christ will be driven down deep in his children's hearts. Paul here, he gives us instructions as husbands on the way this is to be done. So the first thing he tells us is that we're to live out in our homes. 
as Christ loved the church, that's the way we ought to be. To me, that is a more fearful responsibility than submitting to someone else. Whether it be the government, which I'm compelled to do, or wives submitting to their husbands, that I'm to be the picture of Christ in my home. And then he gives us these descriptions on particularly how we are to do that. What are you supposed to do in your home as a husband to reflect Christ in your home? Well, he tells us one thing. He says, he says in two different counts, in verse 23 and verse 25, in verse 23 he says that we're supposed to be uh, saviors of the body. In verse 25 he tells us this. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, you are to love your wife to the point where you would die for your spouse. Now listen, that's not a, just a feeling. right? When we're young and we have puppy love and we're infatuated with somebody, we might have all of these grand feelings that emanate through us, but the longer you're married, you realize the commitment is at the heart of love and at the heart of marriage that you're committed to somebody in good times or in bad, regardless of the personality changes they might have undertaken over the years, the difficulties they've gone through, you're to love your spouse with such a commitment that regardless of what lies in her future and the changes that she has made since the time that you married her, whether it be her appearance, whether it be her personality, whether it be the, the falling apart of her body through illness, whether it be a, the fact that she may not be as committed to you is what you are to her. The Bible's telling us here that in all of those situations, husbands, you're to love your wife until the day she dies. That you're giving yourself of your entirety for your, her welfare. There are some men who think that because of what verse 22 says, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. What they think of is all the rights and the privileges and the powers that they think lie in that position and completely neglect the fact that with every right that we're given by God or by our government comes an equally weighted responsibility. And I feel the weight of the responsibility of being a servant leader in my home much more than I feel the right of being the head of my home. That responsibility at times when you are put in a decision that's difficult and it rides upon you to make that decision. We went and saw a heart doctor for our youngest son and he's laying out before us different types of procedures that they could do to our son. And I ultimately know that my wife are gonna sit and we're not experts in neuroscience and we don't know what's necessarily best. We can listen to the recommendation of doctors and we can do our own research, but ultimately it comes down to us sitting and discussing what we would think is best. And I know ultimately that decision lies in my hands and it's not a decision that I wanted. It wasn't one that I felt this great empowerment. Look how much authority I have in my home. Rather, I felt the weight of responsibility of doing what is in the best interest of my home. It can be a crushing weight if we consider the implications of the decisions that we make. Paul says, we're servant leaders. We're to lead as Christ led. Well, how did Christ lead? Well, the book of Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 tells us that unlike the gods of other religions, our God was different because when he descended and came in the weakness of human flesh, he did not come sitting upon a throne for everyone to worship him. Rather, he didn't come to be served, but rather to serve. Husbands, there's your calling. Your job is to serve your family unto the point of death. That's how you serve your family. Sacrificially, if you're a godly husband, father, I, I say the word husband, but I want to imply within that title, father as well, there is a, a responsibility that we have to make sacrifices. Today in our culture, we see these 
marriages or what's almost promoted in marriage as an agreement. The government looks at marriage as a contract. And in that contract, there seems to be this implied understanding that, listen, as a man, I'm going to go put the hard 40 hours of work in, I'm going to provide, I'm going to do some of the more intense labor, but then I'm going to go act like a child and be able to go do my fun boy things that I used to aspire to do when I was younger. Men, beware. That's not what you've been called to do. You've been called to serve, to sacrifice, to protect, to provide for your home what is needed. But it also tells us there in chapter 6 that we're to bring up our children in the nurture and the discipline of the Lord. Men, that responsibility rests in your hands, how that is to be done. It says, don't provoke your children to wrath or to anger. Don't be, and you'll see within parents and children a relationship sometimes where parents and children don't quite, a child might not quite get along and a a man can become very provocative, especially towards a son if if his personality doesn't completely mesh and he can begin to provoke him towards things and do things that are harmful in, in kindling that relationship. And what the Bible says is, You're not to do that, but rather you're to replace that with purposely raising them in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. You know what that takes? That takes planning, preparation, and thought to do that. See, husbands, if you're thinking that you go to work all day and we come home and we leave the rearing of our children to our wives, what the rules ought to be, what their character shaping ought to be, what the instruction of what they need to know from the word of God, and also just the good citizens that they ought to be to this uh, nation of ours. If you think that can be abdicated to your wife or abdicated to a school uh, situation or something like that, you're neglecting your responsibility in the home. One of the things that we see in the life of Jesus is this immense patience and this deliberate attempt to teach the humble hearts that come to him that desire to learn. I love how Jesus takes time for the most lowly people that come to him. And he instructs them and he teaches them. If you read through uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through chapter 7, there is so much profound instruction that he taught uh, those people. If you go to Matthew chapter 10, if you see the woman at the well in Matthew chapter 4, this woman coming to him and he takes the deliberate attempt to instruct her in the ways of truth, to reveal to her what God uh, wants her to know and what he wants all of us to know. He is very deliberate in that attempt. And I believe as husbands and fathers... We ought to emulate the character of Christ in our intentionality on how we love our wives and we love our children and instruct them. If your wife and your child gets the leftovers from everything else, you're not emulating Christ in the home. They ought not to get the leftovers. There is a reality we have to live with, no doubt. I've got to work i got to provide for my family. But that I am still reserving my heart as much as I possibly can for pouring into my wife and my children. How do we pour into them? Paul answers this. He gets into the specifics. We can sacrifice for them. But then he tells us something else that we ought to be doing to our wife and to our children. Listen to what he says in verse 26. 25, he said, we ought to be willing to die for them. Verse 26, he says this. And now he's speaking, I believe, both in turn in reference to Christ and his relationship with the church. But it becomes indistinguishable to me that it's also speaking of the role of a husband to his wife. That the same, in the same way that Christ does this to his church, the husband is doing this to his wife. Listen to what he says in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it, speaking of the church, with the washing of water by the word. Why? That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
So husbands, there's a charge lying in this. You go out in the world today, maybe some of you are confined to your home quarters because you're managing your home as a woman. But here's, I think, what we can all agree on. Whether you're scrolling through Facebook, whether you're going out in the world, in the workplace as a woman, what we can say is this. The filth of the sin of the world blemishes all of us. The ideas, the misconceptions, all the the, the problems that the world has, it affects us. It affects our character. It affects our minds and where our minds dwell. And so we're required and part of coming into the house of God is that we might purge the sin, the sinful thoughts and ideologies that we have gained from being in the world. That when we come into the house of God, those things can be purged and our minds and hearts can be cleansed by God's word in our hearts. But then Paul here lays an additional responsibility on the men. Because he acknowledges this very thing will happen to your wives. And as the head of your home, you have a responsibility to purge and cleanse her heart and conscience from the filth of this world. How do you do that? By the word. You know your wife better than anybody else knows your wife. You know the things that she struggles with that she would never articulate to another human being in the world. And God commissions us as husbands, to sanctify her with the word. I had a, I would say a mentor that I grew up when I was just probably starting at 15 years old till I was about 20 years old. I would stay the night at their house periodically. He was an older man and me and his grandson were really good friends. And so oftentimes on a Friday night, I would say probably once a month or more, we would go over and we would spend the night at his grandparents' house and I would get to see how they functioned, and that was one of my first exposures to a very strong, godly marriage. And one thing that I was amazed by, now looking back, is how frequently that I would wake up in the morning, maybe 6 or 7 a.m., maybe even later than that, and I would see him and his wife sitting at the breakfast table with the Word of God open, reading the Word of God. Sometimes I'd stand around the corner just to listen to what they were talking about. And what I found that they were talking about is the things that directly impacted them and struggles that they were having and how the word of God was meant to help them through that. It had a profound effect in my life. I found myself gravitating towards that man, gravitating towards that couple and praying in my prayers, God, help me to be like that. Help me to find a spouse whom I can sit at the kitchen table with and look at the word of God and apply that to our lives. Now, that's the whole point of this message. What were they doing? They were reflecting Christ and his church. They were showing forth this beautifully mysterious relationship that will live into eternity. You see, we mirror that great relationship because our relationship, when, it, when our lives are ceased, will be ended. But that relationship between Christ and his church will never be ceased. That man and his wife would get up. I'm not going to say they did it every day. I don't know. I don't suppose that they did. They lived life just like anybody else. He worked a part-time job. He was retired. and She was busied about on other things. But it was a, a profound testimony to a young man watching Because what I did not see was these great sterling Christians. What I saw was godliness demonstrated. And I longed for that godliness in myself. Paul is saying, I believe that an an, an imperative for a husband is to cleanse his family with the washing of the word. We have seen the impact the last 20 years of husbands not doing that, frankly. Their children have marched off other places. They have gained these ideas, which at their core, if you really want to know the truth and you really desire to seek the end of these ideas that are uh, perpetuated by academic institutions, you'll find the hollowness of them very quick if you want to know the truth. They march off to those places. They come back to their home. And many parents say, I don't even recognize my kid anymore. Their beliefs, their ideologies are so foreign. I say this in a preventative measure this morning. 
young husbands and fathers, what are you doing from repeating that same mistake? Don't be so caught up with your career. Don't be so caught up with making money. Don't be so caught up with hobbies that the most valuable thing God has ever given you, you lose it. God knows if every one of us, and it's not an either or, and I don't mean to be it this way, nonetheless, to express the extremity of the need, if it was a choice between being a poor pauper but having children in the house of God and grandchildren growing up in the house of God, serving God and knowing Him, having a vibrant, mature Christian life, or aspiring for all the, the, the various desires of your heart, achieving all of them, surpassing the greatness that you could have imagined, yet losing the most valuable children and grandchildren that you love, losing out on a godly spouse whom you can engage in the work of the Lord. It's with which would you choose? Or rather, which are you choosing now? In my mind, in my heart, if God allows me to live till I'm 70 or 80 or 90 years old, I cannot imagine, like the Apostle John said, a greater joy than seeing my children walk in the truth. God knows in my heart if I could aspire towards anything, it would be up proclaiming the gospel and seeing my whole house of kids and grandkids in the house of God, not just passively listening, actively engaged. Husbands, this does not happen by osmosis or by accident. It happens because just as Christ intentionally came into this world and saw fit to the needs of his children, his people, we do the same hours your wife needs you as a godly leader in her home cleansing her with the water of the word nobody can do it like you can for her and God calls you to that you have to be intentional about it and you may have to change some things in your life to accomplish it but engaging in that battle, the end is worth all the means to accomplish it. You've been called to do it. Paul's instructed us to do it. The last exhortation I could give you is this. Do it. Do it. And if you don't, count the cost to not doing it. Make a conscious decision. And I'll say this. If you make a conscious decision not to do it, it's going to be a lot harder not to do it. The world, Satan has been very intentional in crafting our lives as busy as possible. Making us strive for bigger and better and more. And in the midst, we lose that which is most valuable to us. Don't be that person. How many older men, as I've carried my boys randomly walking around in the store by myself with my three children, how many young men have I, or older men have I come up and had come up to me and, and tell me? Complete strangers, ungodly men for all I know, tell me. You got those precious things right there. Be careful with them. Love them. Invest in them. Because they're gone way too quick. Take that lesson to heart. Not only because the word of scripture bears it. Not only because God ordained it. Because older men in this church around you and strangers around you who have not done it. Lament the rest of their lives not doing it. And warn us. Don't do that. Paul tells us we ought to cleanse our wives and our families with the water of the word. And then he tells us the way we ought to perceive our wives. The way we ought to view her is in the same way that God designed it in Genesis chapter 3. Your wife is you, is what Paul says. She's one flesh with you. It's no longer you and her. It's you. You've become one flesh with this woman. Till death does you part. And you're to love her in this sacrificial way. Giving yourself entirely for her welfare. As if you were doing it for your own. Because Paul says you are doing it for your own welfare. What man harms himself? Does things to harm himself? 
but doesn't nourish and cherish his own flesh. And that's the way you ought to be to your wife. Your wife, when she sees you, ought to know that you will give every fiber of strength that you have and every breath in your body, not only to protect her, but to love her. And that she knows, ultimately, if there is a task which has to be done, if there is a pain which has to be endured, you would readily volunteer a hundred times over than allow her to endure that hardship. And in doing so, the ultimate purpose, the ultimate picture begins to emerge of why God designed this relationship the way that he did. Because then people will see Christ and the beautiful relationship he has with his church eternally. See, folks, there is this, for Christians, there is this veneer. Over, there ought to be this veneer over the world. There ought to be this covering over the world. And it's a carnal, secular, temporal one. The ends of which, of everything in this world, end here. They pass away here. And as Christians, as we see the surface of this world, as we see the surface of one another and of other human beings and institutions, even that God designed, of our spouse, we ought not as Christians to be focused on that outward veneer. But we ought to see past it into the spiritual, into the soul, into the implications that God says sees eternally. And in this design of marriage, let us as Christians not see as the political right sees or the political left sees about marriage or gender or uh, gender roles. Let us not see the way they do for pragmatic carnal purposes. Let's see beyond it and know that when we love our families as God designed and serve our families as God designed, we live out the gospel for the world to see so that when we proclaim these truths, it is only further emphasized by a life they see of us embracing God's truth and calling for our lives. Let them see, let my child see that I love his, his mom so much that when I begin to teach him about the sacrifice of Jesus, when I begin to see the sacrifices that he made for his church, he sees that in me. And wives, there's a whole another portion of exemplifying the other part of this picture for your children to see. And when both do it together, you see what our world today, and I'm going to try to close here, what our culture today has done is they do everything they can to separate men and women and make us enemies to one another. Do you realize God never designed it that way for us to be separate? We were, always, we were created incomplete as men, so God gave us a helper. And together, we were complete. And the complementary roles and design that God has for us is so profound and wonderful, and it's one that he desires us to enjoy in its fullness, even on earth. And the world has grossly perverted it. And they have further grossly perverted what Christians think about it. But we've got to help them see what God's design was and why he designed it that way. Husbands, I believe it starts with you. And it starts with me. As the head of my home, serving them with all that I have. And you with all that you have. It's a powerful thing when a husband and wife come together. And they're both striving in all of their strength to live out their calling as husbands and wives. And especially in our darkened culture that has perverted all those things today, it is a beautiful light. Men should not be depicted as these lazy, aloof, detached, ignorant men sitting in the recliner in front of the television like every television show for 25 years has depicted them. And every woman shouldn't be depicted as a nag, always nagging and trying to control and usurp every kind of decision that a family ought to make. Those are distortions. Don't believe them. 
Our calling today is to live out that in our homes. I pray as husbands and fathers, I'll say this, I love that job. I mean, when I'm right with the Lord, I love the job of being a husband and a father. I don't look at it as a ball and chain. It's a blessing and a privilege. And when I relish and that I fear is slowly escaping from me from the passage of time. You know when you really know that? And I'll drive the final point home with this. When a husband loses his spouse. When a, when a father says goodbye to his children. The pain of that separation. Many men, there's back home. Where we used to live, there's a cemetery. Five or six days a week when I drive home from work, there's a man sitting out in front front of his wife's gravestone. And there were days where it was pouring down rain. He's just sitting there with a little umbrella. And there were days where it was snowy. It's a lot colder, 200 miles north of here. Sometimes it'd be zero degrees outside. And there he would be, sitting And there are flowers all around. I'm not saying that's the most healthy way to cope. I don't know. But I understand the bond that he felt and the pain from its severance. Husbands, God wants you to love your wife that intensely. And the beautiful picture that it shows to the world is otherworldly. God, give us the strength and the grace to live that way. What a calling. Be a representative and picture of Christ in your home. Husbands, fathers, that's what we've been called to do. I pray God would grace us with first the desire and then the ability to do it willing. That's our message this morning. God has certainly convicted my heart with it for a number of weeks. I pray that it would lodge into your hearts, all you men in the congregation today.